Great to have everybody here. My name is Steve Cook. I am thrilled to have you in our booth for the 38th Space Symposium. We have an incredible announcement we are really excited about. But before we get started with that, let's start with a videotape. have an incredible partnership to talk about today. You know, we're really excited to be a part of the Artemis program. Uh, we've been a part of it now for several years, and we're excited about taking that next step. And we're about to enter a new moon race, except we're going to enter a moon race with a partner that is really good at going fast, NASCAR. As we talk about and unveil today our Artemis Lunar Terrain Vehicle. By the way, I think LTV, I hope it is as common as SUV in the future because we're opening up a new frontier. And this is the day one of us announcing what that new frontier is gonna look like. And before I do that, let me introduce uh, Mr. Pete Junk. Pete is the Chief Marketing Officer for NASCAR. Pete. Thank you, Steve. Uh, great to be here with you all. Uh, great to be here with you all this morning. Uh, uh, it, I, I got, this is a tremendous day on behalf of the NASCAR team uh, for us to be announcing this partnership. Um, admittedly, for a sports marketing guy, it's a little humbling to be around all of this uh, aerospace knowledge, so I'm a bit of a sponge. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. The last couple months, we've been uh, getting to know the Lighthouse and Dynetics team really well about the company and the brand and the products, and really been inspired you know, by the, the cutting-edge sort of technology and commitment to um, space exploration and, and all of that. So we are so thrilled about this uh, partnership. Uh, this is a big year for NASCAR. It's our 75th anniversary, um, and uh, we take a lot of pride on whether it was, you know, the, the earliest days of building race cars and racing them on the beach of Daytona Beach, Florida. Um, really grounded in reliability and, and speed, um, and, uh, and and all of that. And so to apply that um, looking forward is is huge. Um, well, our 75th anniversary, we're certainly celebrating the the 75 year past and, and all the kind of stories and milestones. We're also looking forward to what does what the future of, of NASCAR look like? Um, and this partnership with Lighthouse is a great example of that. Um, another thing that really gets us kind of excited is just sort of how our, our companies and organizations really align in terms of our, our philosophies and commitment, commitments to things like sustainability uh, and equality. Um, so really excited to unveil this LTV. I love it. We're going to make this acronym uh, massive as big as, as SUV. Um, and really excited about uh, the future of this partnership. So over to you, Jonathan. Hi, everybody. I'm uh, Jonathan Pettis, Senior Vice President for Aerospace, Civil, and Defense at Lighthouse. And again, thank you all for being here. And thanks to Pete for being here. We're super excited about this partnership. Um, I think the goals and the themes and the emphasis areas that NASCAR has for the future share, are shared greatly with what NASA is pursuing and what we're proud. One of the reasons we're so proud to partner uh, with NASA on the Artemis program. And as you have a chance during the next couple of days to visit our booth, you'll see a wide variety of things we're doing in the space world, but obviously several different roles in the Artemis campaign. We couldn't be more proud to be part of that. Uh, from a NASCAR partnership perspective, their deep experience and capability in developing high-performance high vehicles in harsh environments is something that obviously can play a, a great deal of, uh, can help us a great deal as we engineer this vehicle. And so we're looking forward to tapping into that talent. For example, the most recent effort they've had in designing their next-gen race car, if you look at some of the principles that they had that they used to develop that new vehicle, they're shared with some of the criteria and principles that NASA needs for a 
sustainable lunar terrain vehicle. In terms of, of the focus on fast and uh, agile maintenance, agile replacement of parts, designing for maintainability, who could be better at that problem than an organization that has to focus on high speed maintenance and pit stops? And so taking that innovation and their experience in that, we think is really um, important to how we want to approach this problem, again, to develop a safe and sustainable vehicle. And then finally, NASCAR is very good at connecting sponsors. And we are excited about what that may mean in terms of our commercial plans for the future and how we can leverage their expertise relative to our commercial pursuits. We think there's a lot of opportunity there, and so we're super excited about that. So without further ado, I think we have Steve and Pete in pole position here. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you the Lidos NASCAR Lunar Terrain View. Right. So um, just a word or two about the vehicle. Uh, and obviously we have a team here that is prepared to talk you through some of the details of our design. But number one, just as we've done with our lander, we have a crew-centric design. So we started with a crew, with model astronauts, male and female, in terms of looking at how to design the rover around those human operations. Of course, we also offer, as required by NASA, autonomous operation as well. Um, secondly, we have really focused on maximizing payload capacity and capability. And so in thinking about how we can modularize our payload capability in terms of also providing uh, infrastructure such as power, communications, and thermal control that will allow for maximum payload utilization. And obviously that's a key part of our commercial plans as well. And we've gotten feedback from a variety of potential commercial and academic partners around payload needs. And so we've tried to address that as we've designed the vehicle. I'd also point out that we have the only, I think, uh, I'll take a risk, the only person in the building that has actually engineered and developed an operational lunar rover. And that's Mr. Ron Creel here in the white coat. <laughs> We are, we are so proud to have him part of our team, and uh, lest you think that the problems of those of that era are any different than the problems of this era, Ron really quickly informed us that physics haven't changed, the lunar ecosystem hasn't changed, but he's doing thermal analysis on the most modern information technology tools for our team, so that's pretty cool. So Ron's going to be here. He'll be happy to uh, help you with some of his experience and knowledge as well as the rest of our team. So again, thank you for everybody coming out and seeing the rover, and we look forward to uh, uh, having the chance to talk with you more during the week. I, if, if we have just a couple of minutes, we can take a couple of questions, if anybody has it. Other, otherwise, we're certainly glad to meet with the uh, folks uh, uh, through the next couple of days. What sort of range does the vehicle have? The range? Um, I want to let, where's Matt at? Uh, I'll let Matt answer that, because if I do, I want to make sure I get the range number correct. Yeah, the vehicle range is in excess of 20 kilometers. What powers it? It is powered by uh, solar energy and batteries. Anybody else? This is Matt Dowd, our program manager. So I uh, appreciate Matt being here and he'll be available to talk as well. So obviously, yes. With this uh, chassis configuration, do you have other concept models for different um, form factors? We do. The question is, we have other concept models. Um, we do. Um, and uh, if you have a chance to come by and speak to our team in detail, we'll tell you a little bit more about some of those ideas, as well as some of the components. Let me add as well, this is not a model. This is a working prototype. So this is right off the, fresh off the, the uh, assembly line. Uh, putting this together. This will go through its paces uh, at the Johnson Space Center eventually. Uh, we'll start off uh, in our own facility, but this is a working model. This is this shows off the key features of what we're trying to do, and we can talk you through those from the really creative uh, tire technology, 
wheel technology, removal approach, all of those kinds of things will get demonstrated in this 1G demonstrator. So that's that's another key to this whole thing. Yeah, and if you play, pay particular attention to the tires, that's NASA technology that we've evolved. So we've actually leveraged the innovation and evolution of NASA technology with these tires, and that's a really hard problem. There's a question about how to how we will assemble it. Um, we have uh, we are aware of landers that are capable of uh, of uh, providing transportation, both ours and other options, and so. In terms of the assembly, that's about as far as I'll probably go. Yeah, yeah. Just two things, real quick. Uh, you will, you'll see here two things I'm happy about in this vehicle. You don't see radiators. Okay, we had a lot of trouble with dust getting on radiators, and astronaut wasting an awful lot of science time trying to clean radiators on the moon. You'll also see they had trouble with the seat belts. We've got, we've got this system is just like they have on roller coasters here on the United States. Is as a special lowering system that is used to, to get away from seat belts. You don't have seat belts that don't work. Thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you from during the rest of the show. Thank you. It's a it has four separate four separate motor drive system, uh, just like our rovers we had on the moon on Apollo program. <laughs> I think they still, unfortunately, relying too much on Earth testing. We can't get a pressure low enough. The moon is a whole heck of a lot lower pressure on the moon, and it affects the dust on the on the on the radiators. And uh, but we don't have the radiators. And uh, you'll see uh, you'll see that back here it has an end effector. Uh, this is done by the folks in Canada. I think are helping with that. And that's going to be used to collect samples of ice and other materials, put them in a box, and then try to store those and get them back to Earth. The battery box is taken off there. The battery box goes down underneath that area right there. So it and it has it has a thermal strap up to another box that's not on here yet. The, the, this this represents a design from uh, a few weeks ago, but there's been a few adjustments. The main thing that I was pointing out was the use here of the lowering system here that interfaces with the suit. Uh, very easy for the astronauts to secure themselves for their for their driving, and uh, it's just like they have in roller coaster systems now. They don't they don't have seat belts are too too undependable, and people can take them off. We had wire mesh tires. Our tires weighed about 15 pounds. I haven't weighed one of these, but it's probably about 20, 30 pounds. And uh, it's a uh, great, it's great, great, great use of wire mesh technology. The solar panel you see here back, it'll be positioned such that uh, you can uh, point it at the sun and recharge the batteries. We didn't have that feature. It's a little bit different. The fenders are for are single piece, single piece, which is better. It's not going to fold up. We transport it. They've they've sized it up such that it fits on. Many, many different rocket launches, launchers, and in fact, may also actually go on a human landing. Uh, uh, the vehicle that you see behind you in the models here, there, there's a set of rover coming out there. And actually, that's one of the hope for uh, on a demo launch, is to actually have a rover come out of the uh, human landing system. Uh, What's the mass of the rover? Uh, uh, this, this rover? Yes. I, I don't know the latest mass. There, Kurt. Kurt. Hey, Kurt. Kurt, what's your, Kurt, your, what's your, final, what's your final, final estimate on the mass? Uh, this one here? Yeah, this one here is about 1,500 pounds. Yeah, just for the 1G, the 1G prototype, yeah. Huh? The rovers on the moon, though, though, on the moon, they carried three times their mass on the vehicles themselves. Tell me about these, these tires again. Why do we need these kinds of tires as opposed to, with, you know, pressure and that? Is that why we need these kinds of tires, or is another reason? Well... 
These tires are, are similar to the ones on the, ro on the rovers on the moon. Uh, they're a toroid type shape here. They're very much like your radial tires. The uh, radial tires are a single pour, a single mesh. They're rubber, rubber tires, but you have here, you have here uh, the ability to support the weight uh, and, and spread it out with this, with this member. In fact, they've also got inside, there's a, the ring inside here that prevents them from deflecting too much. You see that, see that uh, inner, inner assembly that goes up there? Yes. Goes all around? Yes. That, that, present, that prevents, we had a similar type thing on the rover wheels on the moon. And uh, you don't want to, to deflect too much. You want to bounce away. People, there's only damage we saw on the rovers on the wheels on the moon. There's about, a, on Apollo 17, there's a, maybe a tennis ball sized depression in there. But it never was anything that the crew indicated give them any kind of any kind of any kind of a loss of traction. And uh, I tell you, I can't imagine how this must feel for you to have designed uh, the you know, the Apollo rover and now hopefully the rover for Artemis as well. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Uh, thank you very much for interviewing me. Yep.